Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, okay. This, I don't like this room is very plastered me, so if you can't hear me or Australian accents cause you distress, please let me know and I can speak slower for you. Uh, so, this work um, that I will present this afternoon is sort of one third of my uh, doctoral research. Um, it's one of my case studies that forms part of a, a sort of broader interrogation about LGBT communities and religious communities. So, um, in preparing this presentation, I've tried to narrow down quite a lot of material in my chapters into something that makes sense as a narrative. And what I came to is really that I'm talking about stories by women for women. And the women I'm looking at, the women I talk about, are women who live within Orthodox and ultra-Orthodox Jewish communities in the diaspora, specifically the United States, Canada, and the United Kingdom. Although at the moment, I'm narrowing that community, and it's looking like it's going to be the United States. And that's really based on the richness of some of the narratives coming out of those communities there. So the women, that, these women are women who recognize their sexual orientation as lesbian, or who are in the process of doing that. There are also women who live within religious laws and norms that define their community and forbid or disavow the expression of that sexuality for a range of reasons, um, some of which we'll talk about today, but I'd be more than happy to get to some of the more legal questions of this um, if you'd like to ask. Uh, and there are women who experience secular law in their surrounding environment in a very indirect or limited way. Um, so questions that I'm still starting to answer as I work through this work uh, is, to what extent is this a feminist story? Um, to what extent is it a queer story? To what extent is it an intrinsically female story? Um, and the very important thing for me to recognize from the outside, outset is that I'm an outsider to this research. I'm not Jewish, I am a woman. Um, but obviously there are limitations in my understanding of these communities and I try to deal with them with sensitivity, but I'm also very aware that I'm not of this group. So because we're lawyers, let's deal with some, some definitions. Um, I'm looking at lesbian women and I, I sort of provided a definition of that here. One of the reasons I've talked about it in that way is that I'm not dealing with some of the newer or perhaps in secular contexts more relevant LGBT discussions like about transgender rights, um, intersex, asexuality, queer, questing. And the reason I haven't gone down some of those avenues, even though they're very relevant for equality rights, is because the community is sort of self in this. So these women identify as lesbian, I'm respecting that identity. I haven't gone too far into LGBT theory. Um, so I've just provided a definition of sexual orientation here, and just to clear up, I'm not looking at gender construct. So I'm not, I'm not, and again, that's connected to the transgender issue, but I think it's important to say that up front. Um, apologies to Jewish people in the room. Uh, this is a very basic understanding of halakha, and again, also apologies for my pronunciation of Hebrew words. Um, I'm looking at the body of Jewish law and tradition that is made up of the law of the Torah, the surrounding legal texts and the legal traditions that have been codified over time. And my secular law frameworks, I'm obviously looking sort of in, at the periphery at state law and legal frameworks that protect and manage individual rights for these people. So human rights codes, um, equal marriage recognition at a court level, constitutional guarantees of rights and particularly equality rights. Um, and this is to sort of situate my scholarship or my work in, in, in the Jewish community. Um, you can see at the top of the first few categories, this is a, uh, a, a sort of a useful kind of summary of the branch of the Judaism provided by The Economist last year. Um, after there was a discussion about ultra-Orthodox groups in America and what proportion of Judaism they made up in America. So you can see that ultra-Orthodox already um, the source of Biblical law is the Torah, and they believe that that is dictated to God by Moses. Um, and authority of religious law is God is all God inspired and thus immutable. So in modern Orthodox communities, you have a similar relationship to the sources of Biblical law. You have something more, infle more flexible interpretation, so as we'll see, that's not the case for uh, interpretations of rules against homosexuality. 
Um, Starting to talk about the women in this story, uh, the, I found some incredible images preparing for this presentation. This is a, a ready wedding in Israel in 2011. And this is a, um, a Haredi bride preparing for her wedding day with members of her family. And so, talking a little bit about this then, it's a feminist project. Um, the experience of Orthodox women is generally prescribed and managed by a sort of mitzvot, so the commandments in the Torah about the roles of women as wives and mothers. So that's seen as a primary role, and that's the primary role that women accept and in many cases want. Um, what I what I find into is it's a very uncomfortable feminist experience for someone who probably identifies as a third wave feminist from a secular background to see the lives of these women as a feminist experience. Um, radical feminism has difficulty fitting the stories of these women into its narrative um, on, on a range of levels. Now there are feminists doing interesting work about this community. Tamar Ross has written some very interesting work about looking at orthodox feminists and saying, well, it might be, for a secular conception of feminism, it might be basic or even regressive to say that wanting an equivalency of male position is a feminist point. But for these women, that is the feminism that they aspire to. Um, so the feminist goals of orthodox lesbian women often relate to their own acceptance of their sexuality, or their family's relationship, or their family's acceptance of their sexuality, um, or a discussion with their rabbi about their sexuality. These aren't necessarily large-scale activist goals, but they are feminist, or I can take that feminist. Um, there's a difficulty, of course, in that. So this is another last image of Haredi families in Brooklyn. You can see the mother and the little girls and the traditional um, costume for the men. Um, the difficulty is that these women wouldn't necessarily put themselves into a feminist narrative without being framed in that way. So I am also seeing narratives that say, I don't see myself as feminist. I don't want to be feminist. I don't aspire to that. I want to live traditionally, but I want to recognize myself as a lesbian. Don't tell me how to be a woman. Um, so writing on this is, is, is challenging um, to give effect to that as a right and also to give effect to it as a narrative, but still to frame it as a feminist experience in a respectful way. Um, okay, and the other thing that I think I'll say while we're looking at this, this photograph is the legal element of my research, well, I mean, sort of the framing of my research is to look at the biblical law of the law of the Torah and secular law that deals with LGBT uh, rights and see how these two these two frameworks influence these women. And when I started to do this research, I felt that most of the work I would be doing would be making the case that um, Jewish law or halakha is is law. That that would be where the challenge is, and that's not where I found my challenge at all. Um, it's very cleanly organised, and I'll, I'll go into that talk to that in a minute. But what it's very clear from looking at the narratives and from reading the biblical prohibitions and the commandments is that. Um, they are all encompassing and they operate on these people in a very direct way and the relationship with law is far more direct than say my relationship with secular law that provides me with rights or obligations. So I guess I just open with that and say that it's, I felt that sort of situating this women in a legal context would be a challenge but in fact that's not what I found to be. So I've obviously oversimplified the, the scenario but I thought for me, as an outsider, this is what I kind of envisage it as in terms of putting the two legal frameworks together. So if we see sort of a state law framework for a basic one with a constitution primary rule, and if you take that to be the Torah, or the five books of law that make up the Torah as kind of a primary rule basis, and this is where the biblical law, the bedrock law comes from for Orthodox Judaism, then obviously in a state law context you have legislation, delegated legislation, the secondary rules to interpret the primary rule, um, and in Orthodox Judaism you have a range of sources, but most significantly you have the Talmud, um, which is sort of a, a collection of decisions and debates and rabbinical discussions over a long period of time about biblical law situated in the Torah. So then obviously we have jurisprudence in the state law framework, and then in the Halakha you have codes of law um, that actually codified to for everyday people to use throughout time. So the 12th and 14th centuries, I think, are where those two codes of law are situated. And then they flow down to rabbinical decisions and communities today.
So very quickly, because I think we're all really well aware of this, um, I can talk about obviously in the last 15 years in the United States and Canada, there have been a lot of LGBT developments in terms of quality recognition of marriage, but also of legal personhood and status. So over to Alan Hodges is the same-sex marriage equality decision in the United States. It's a landmark case, we're all aware of it, I think. Uh, it's a five-four decision that the fundamental right to marry is guaranteed to same-sex couples by both the due process clause and the equal protection clause of the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution. Um, I, I've situated here because it's going to be part of my broader research, but also because it's we, we're seeing evidence that this decision has galvanized both conservative groups and LGBT lobby groups in the states. Um, so it's relevant to these communities, even though it doesn't necessarily impact them directly. Um, obviously in Canada, we have the Civil Marriage Act, which legalized same-sex marriage across Canada. I just sort of reference how in Canada there is the case, of, the case that gave rise to these discussions about same-sex marriage in Canada. More recently, we have the Jonah decision and therapeutic fraud cases in the states, which have caused um, a lot of discussion in Orthodox Jewish communities. So the Jonah decision um, was it's the only recognized, clinically recognized um, provider of reparative therapy, so sexual change therapy. Uh, Jonah stands for Jews offering new alternatives to healing. It used to stand for Jews offering new alternatives to homosexuality until 2014. Uh, when they sort of changed pack. It was run by an Orthodox rabbi, Arthur Goldberg, who uh, has subsequently divested himself of Jonah, and that Jonah's going to be shut down. Um, the case that was run was the Southern Poverty Law Centre on behalf of two young men who underwent reparative therapy for a number of years uh, with Jonah on the um, basis that uh, it was constituted therapy for that sexual orientation change isn't therapeutically possible. And on that basis, the, clinic, the clinical intervention and the other interventions on all the clinical, these young men received were fraudulent. That was successful. It's a case of the Superior Court of New Jersey. And there's currently a therapeutic fraud bill on the floor of the US Congress and on the floor as a committee. And I think it could probably stay there during the current administration's position. But it's, it's just relevant to say that this is something that's been talked about in the US and has been talked about very recently. So the questions that I'm still looking at are, do these developments influence conservative religious traditions on sexuality? And do these developments influence Orthodox Jewish, influence Orthodox lesbian women? Do we, do we see any sort of connection between those two? So, moving now. This is, I think, again, a Victoria Prohibition against male homosexual conduct, which we're all quite familiar with, um, or maybe it's just me and I spend a lot of time reading biblical prohibitions now. Um, <laughs> so the reason I put it here is because it's, it's the centre of the storm, as it were, in terms of biblical prohibitions on sexual conduct. It's not the only one. It's situated in um, a book of law, Leviticus, which uh, also lists a number of other sexual transgressions which are forbidden. Um, so the prohibition is thou shalt not fly with mankind as a womankind. It is total bark abomination. Um, what I, the reading I've been doing about sort of the, the the Talmud interpretation of this and later legal code interpretation of this is that it's a very legal understanding of the prohibition itself. So the Talmud breaks down the category of transgression. I'm not going to try and pronounce that because it would be awful. But to a serious sin of illicit sexual contact, which is the most serious prohibition that you can have. And the severity of the transgression is justified by the severity of the sanction. So in Leviticus 4, 20, verse 13, we have the sanction. So the sanction is death. So quite, re quite rationally, as I think as a legal text, they have said, well, we can understand what the Torah felt about this transgression because they prohibited the death. We come then to the role of women and lesbian sex. Um, it's accepted across Orthodox Jewish commentators and rabbinical scholars that there's no direct or prohibition against lesbian sex. So on some level, there's no primary rule there. Um, it's been, brought, the Leviticus 18, 23 has been quite, 18, 22, sorry, it's been quite broadly interpreted to apply to all aspects of homosexual relationships by some rabbis, to homosexuality itself. But even the most conservative positions that I have read don't extend it to lesbian 
sex or lesbian relationships. So we move then to look at the Talmudic, the Talmudic commentaries to look for a secondary world position, and we find two. So I put here the most relevant and direct one. So this was actually a, a rabbinical uh, decision about uh, a woman who had extramarital sex and whether or not she was eligible to marry a priest. Um, and the discussion is wide ranging. And one of the conservative rabbis in the discussion says, um, Rabbi Eliezer says that when a single man is intercourse with a single woman, she becomes a zoner, which means prostitute. Well, that is true when the marital sex is with a man, but sex with a woman is a mere indecency. So you can see, I mean, that there's a movement from a, a, an illicit senior sexual conduct to a transgression and mere indecency. Now, obviously, this is an English translation, but I looked at about 10 different translations, and you get similar wording with, with a similar um, seriousness of transgression reflected in different wording. So then, we then go to the rule against lesbian marriage, because there are two sort of different ways of looking at this, and the Talmud's approached it in two different ways. So at the beginning of Leviticus, we have the statement of, after the doings of the land of Egypt, where you dwelt, don't do that anymore. Now the Sifra, which is sort of the supplementary legal code to Leviticus, says, well, what did this pertain to? Well, it pertained to unnatural acts like a man would marry a man, and a woman a woman, and a man would marry a woman and a daughter, and a woman would marry a daughter. So this sort of indirect reference to same-sex marriage between women is then transformed in the Mishnah Torah, so one of these legal codes that we're talking about interpretation of primary and secondary rules, to be a sin of rebelliousness. And this is the, the most direct comment that we have on, well, what exactly did the Talmud mean when they said that it is a transgression and what are we talking about? There's different ways of reading this, of course. It's an incredibly rich discussion about um, different aspects of the Mishnah Torah and different aspects of the Talmud. But um, Steve Greenberg, who is the first openly gay um, Orthodox rabbi, um, for him, he says, well, the position here is really legal overreach. So we're trying to tie a legal prohibition to a rabbinical ruling to increase its normative force. So what we're talking here about is not necessarily the sin of lesbian sex itself, but the rebelliousness that women show when they engage in that sex. We can't allow that to happen because heterosexual relations are the, are the basis of the community and we can't risk marriages foundering on this type of reason. So that's why this, he says this is legal overreach. Rebecca Alpert, from a feminist perspective, says, no, this is extraordinarily lenient, in fact. So even in the 12th century, we can't have lesbian sex being identified for a flogging or a transgression that is punishable by any kind of physical harm. It's just that we are concerned about women behaving in this way. And the rebelliousness of wives sleeping with other women is not encouraged, and husbands are entitled to come to a rabbi and seek a ruling on that. So being a lawyer, I sort of went away and I read a lot of books about this and broke it down to this is really where the halakha stands on the biblical and Talmudic prohibitions on lesbian sex and relationships as separate to homosexual sex and relationships, which is a far more complex issue than I'm reading about this end. Um, so it's not really a prohibited, a prohibited sexual transgression as the Torah understands it because there's no explicit biblical prohibition against it. And interestingly, there's no actual intercourse in lesbian sex, which was a relevant consideration for traditional Jewish law, and was a relevant consideration for secular law until the 20th century, in fact. So it's a, it's a widely noted, um, I guess, anecdote, but it actually is true that Queen Victoria didn't believe that lesbian sex was possible, and that's why there were no rules um, in the English Women's Code against it. This is sort of a very ancient version of that norm. Uh, now I'm going to try, Please bear with me for a second, because I'm going to let, let I'm going to let Orthodox women discuss these legal findings.
אינטימי מיני. אנשים עושות בחתונה, עושים את הטקס לרחוב הביתה, הם מן הסתם חיים ביחד, ומה הם עושים ביחד? הוא פשוט לא רוצה לדבר את השפה הזאת. את יודעת מה אתם אומרים בכלל בדיון הזה? שאנחנו מנסות להגדיר פה כל מיני הגדרות, שאני חושבת שאני לא רואה בשביל זה מבחוץ, אני לא יודעת מה זה בכלל. כאן זה כאילו מין דיון תלוש, תדברו על זה עם רב, אני אומרת, מה את רוצה ממנו? מה את רוצה ממנו? את אומרת שאת חיה, אין לך שום חלק את הכוח זה גם כבר לא עובדתיות. תגידי, בשביל האנשים או בשביל השאלה? זה לא מדהים, אני אומרת כמו הקדוש ברוך הוא דבר. אני לא אמרנו מול הקהילה. לא אמרנו שום רב, שום רב לא שאל אותי, שום דבר. אם ישאלו אותי, לא הייתה לו תשובה. Israel to the US to the UK, 
In about 2010, uh, an Orthodox woman in Israel, a gay woman, decided that she would start a conversation online and start a blog. It's been a huge success, and there are women who have written to her from all over the world who have joined this community. Um, Keep Not Silent, which is the film that I just showed you a clip from, is about the beginning of that journey for those women. Um, it's also turned into a book called Keep Your Lives Away From Them, uh, which is a book that's available um, in, in English and I think in French, um, and it's been really widely distributed. And then there's obviously the very famous film Trembling Before God, which was sort of the one that kick-started this conversation back in 2001 um, about exactly this question. Well, what is the Jewish law position on lesbianism and homosexuality and, and what does that mean? While it's loading, I'll just say, um, this is uh, showing you this is really to show you, I guess, the, the stakes of these women, how high the stakes are for these women when they engage in this conversation when they share their stories, but also how willing they are to do that, provided that secrecy and anything can be provided. So, I guess, in a practical way, this is sort of a recognition of that theoretical absence and silence that we saw in terms of the legal position, but it's also a demonstration of female communities developing in secret, um, which is Lesbian out loud, 
Then I retreated to the synagogue among the women with their quiet camaraderie and whispered prayers. But it gave me no comfort. I remember how I looked around and silently told them, you think I'm one of you sisters, but if you could see me, you'd turn away and pretend I wasn't there. And the reason why that quote speaks to me in terms of my work is that <coughs> it's looking at this question of what is more valued, a religious identity or a sexual identity? Because for a lot of these people, they're choosing between them and they don't want to. So at the moment, uh, for Leah, she makes the decision to leave her community and it caused her to have a nervous breakdown. She doesn't want to leave her community, she wants to stay within her family and her broader community. Orthodox communities that are known for being um, in incredibly close and connected and that's something that these women really value. Um, but for other women um, and for other couples, they choose to stay within their community and to hire and disavow their sexuality. So what are the next steps or where, where am I with this? Um, at the moment, I'm, I'm in a learning process and a writing process of understanding how the religious laws that I've had to learn about hide and silence lesbian identity, but also frame it in a way that gives it some freedom that I wasn't expecting. Um, I want to learn how to accommodate, so how to understand the lives of these women as a feminist project without projecting what I think is feminist on them and their experience. I want it to be inclusive feminism. Um, I would really like to talk about or to look at how we can build bridges between religious law and secular legal protections, because it seems to me that secular protections have actually helped start this conversation, even with a group of people that really don't have a lot of contact with secular law because of the nature of their religious life. But there seems to be a general environment out there that has raised this as an issue. And through that, they are having conversations about how their religious law does or doesn't allow them to live their sexual life. And lastly, very aspirationally, I, I want to, I, I like this work, or I like this work to start more stories. I want to support women to connect, to share stories of how they identify with one another. On the proviso, I said, as I said at the outset, that I'm an outsider to this work. So I'll, at, at any step, I'm only ever looking in. I'm not partaking of it. Um, and there's one last clip that I'd really like to show you before I get to my... Thank you very much. <laughs>